Welcome to Your Pick, a film podcast. I'm Geneva. And I'm Tatum. <laughs> <laughs> you sound so whimsical. I'm so excited. <laughs> so excited. We're two friends who love movies and love sharing them with each other. Each week we take turns picking a film that is close to our hearts and talk about why it moves us. But today mm. we're doing something just a little bit different. It's been a really long time since we've had a chance to record um, various life things have just been, you know, happening as they do. Just but making a are... casual callback to Geneva's Barbosa impression. I'm just going to say, <laughs> too long. <laughs> <laughs> too long. <laughs> <laughs> we're back today. We are very excited. And we're just going to do a little, little mini-sode where we just kind of catch each other up on... What we've been watching. Um, Just preparing everybody. It's not going to be mini. It's it. It, it, <laughs> yeah. it might be I a little long. Mini, so <laughs> I'm probably being way too optimistic for us or pessimistic for us. You know what? We love talking about movies. Mm. We love sharing what we've been watching. Mm. So that's what we're going to do today. Yeah. Um, welcome Tatum, back, we last... everybody. Thank you for welcome being a back. loyal listener that's waited for a half a year for us to return. Yeah. <laughs> We're so happy you're we back. We last recorded at the very beginning of April. So, I mean, obviously Tatum and I have been talking to each other since then. <laughs> no, but we haven't we, we really don't, gotten... We don't talk outside. Yeah, we <laughs> never talked. We didn't even see each other in person. No. <laughs> Definitely. <this> no. Time. <laughs> we did. Um, but we haven't really had a chance to, like, sit down, do a deep dive on some of the notable things we've been watching, our reactions, um, stuff like that. So that's what we're going to do today. We're just going to kind of run through a whole bunch of stuff and <laughs> probably have a lot of side tangents and it's going to be a good time. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. All right. Uh, do you want me to start or do you want to start off? Uh, I can start. So yeah, go for just, it. just to give you guys an idea of what the format of today is going to be. So we're just kind of going to talk about movies that we've watched this year that we've either liked or hated, basically anything that seemed notable and something we wanted to talk about. And then we'll do some TV shows, um, and then we can jump into movies released this this year as well that we have seen. So, yeah, yeah that's kind of the format we're going to go by. Geneva and I are going to do two to three things each, and then alternate, and then go back and forth, and so on and so forth. So, uh, the fact that each of us are doing two to three things and going back and forth gives you an idea of... The amount of uh, <laughs> titles that we want to discuss here. So we're, we're going to stop when we're done. Come along for <laughs> we'll the see. ride, everybody. It's going to be great. Um, oh, let's just say real quick, Geneva, to start that like yep. if anyone prefers our traditional format, um, the next episode that's coming out will be back to our usual format. And the movie yes. we will be discussing is called The Village. It's Geneva's yes. pick. Yep. Um, very excited. Yes. And also, we will be, from here on out, releasing episodes every other week as opposed to every week because life be crazy, but Geneva yes. and I still want to record this podcast, so that's a little bit of a format shift. But Yes, thank you. Yeah, just wanted to say all of that up front before we, yeah. before we dive in. Some important housekeeping. Yes. But all of that being said, um, I will start with... The first three things um, that I would like to talk about, and these are purely just in order of how I watch them according to my letterbox list, so there's no other significance to the order in which I talk about these things. Um, but the first movie that I want to talk about is called Desert Hearts. Um, I'm actually looking it up to see. Yeah, so it's called Desert Hearts. It's from 1985, and it is a iconic um, lesbian film that is honestly a film that everybody should watch. It is about um, a middle-aged woman who goes to this town and um, she's like divorcing her husband and she meets this young woman who is out and openly a lesbian and has a... She's not necessarily fully accepted by her community, um, but the main character, her name's Helen... She is, no, her, na her name is not Helen. The actress's name is Helen. The character's oh. name is Vivian. Um, <laughs> okay. But she's kind of intrigued by this young woman. And it's like, hmm, she seems kind of brave. And I kind of admire her, but I don't really know why. And then as time goes on, 
the other woman who is out, her name's Kay, she kind of holds Vivian's hand and guides her into, like, owning the fact that she is a woman who loves women and would rather be with women. Um, And the two of them have a very interesting relationship. They kind of, like, it's not really something where... It's not a romantic comedy. It's not like they fall in love and have this beautiful romance and there's this happily ever after ending. Um, It's, yeah, it's very much so like self-discovery in the process. And it's just a very beautiful film. It's very well shot. Um, It has a very, very romantic and beautiful sex scene in the movie because a lot of sex scenes in movies are very like exploitative or like we want to turn on the audience, which like, I'm very anti-exploitative sex scenes, and if you want to turn on the audience, there's a time and a place for that, but that is not what this is. Um, It's just a beautiful story about lesbian love and self-discovery and self-acceptance, so that's the first one. The way you're describing it makes it sound like Carol, but made in Mm. 1985 and set in the desert. Mm. Does that... It is it, it... Are there similarities in the vibes? There are similarities, except that in Carol the younger one is the one who's very uncertain and kind of like doesn't Ah. know what she wants. Mm -hmm. Um, And you see a lot more of the divorce there. Whereas this one is like, you don't really see the husband that much. Um, He's kind of like out of the picture a little bit more or less. Um, So it's very good. I would highly recommend it. Also, I'm kind of cliff noting it based off of what I remember. I've seen this movie once. I watched it in April. So it's been several months. (laughs) So hopefully my summary is A, accurate, (laughs) um, and B, gets people interested because it's a very good film. Um, I think I watched it on Max, I think. And I don't know if it's still there, but that's where I saw it. Um, The next one is I wanted to talk about American fiction because on a previous podcast episode, Geneva talked about her relationship with the film. And my response was kind of like, I don't know if I want to see it. I'm not going to pay to see it in theaters. I feel like it's a movie that's very much so like teaching to white people and not really as necessary for African-Americans to watch. Um, I disagree with that statement uh, now that I've seen it. (laughs) I think that it is a very, a very good movie. I was a little bit like, I thought it was fine for most of it, but then the ending of the movie really is what got me because I was like oh now I need to go back and watch it all over again because I fully understand what it is that this movie was trying to do um it's you know like Geneva said in in another episode like it's just a very interesting and profound commentary on African-American storytelling and how those things are received and um yeah it's I I really liked it um I would say if you watch it and you're kind of a little bit mixed on it, wait till the end because the ending really puts all of it in perspective, in my opinion. Um, I'm really glad you liked it. I don't think we've talked about it since you'd seen it. Uh, I was very curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah. yeah. Do you agree with me that like the sort of hook of it, which is the more comedic elements are maybe the weaker part and the stronger part is actually the more dramatic like family relationships? I would agree with that. Yeah. But I also think that not that the the comedy is bad. It's just, for me, the, the familiar relationships were the more interesting part. Yeah, I mean, I found that to be more interesting for sure. But that's also why, again, like, it's hard. To, for me, it's very hard to talk about this movie without talking about the ending. Because mm-hmm. I feel like the yeah. ending explains the purpose of the humor. Even though it feels a little bit, like, less interesting I fully understand why it's there after getting to the end because again I watched the movie and I was kind of like okay I understand what you're trying to say but like the tones are kind of weird and there's added things that I'm like okay that feels very cliche why is it here and I think the humor kind of falls into that but then the end I was like yeah. oh I, I I get it <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes I would agree with you but I also think that I appreciate it a lot more knowing what the ending is and how that fits into the whole piece. Um, So yes, again, just in order of things that I watched, I, um, this is so weird talking about movies that I saw once like months ago. I feel like I'm just going off of feelings of what I remember as opposed to the specifics of like what actually (laughs) happened. 
<laughs> um, but so I saw Furiosa, a Mad Max saga. Um, it is a movie that I really think I need to see again because I think I went in with very high expectations and I went in with a thought of like what it was going to be. And I ultimately ended up being kind of disappointed. I gave it four stars on Letterboxd. The more I think about it, I feel like my honest opinion is probably three and a half. But again, I think I should watch it again because I I think I just wasn't prepared for what it was. Um, I will say I think that um, I thought that the one of the things I really liked about the original was that it was very practical. Like the cars were I mean, we had a whole episode on this, like pretty much everything was done practically unless it had to be CGI. This movie, there were several moments where I was like, this CGI is terrible. Like it just it, it, this person is clearly standing in front of a green screen and th- there was such minimal effort put into making this feel like it was real. Um, and so that kind of bothered me. It felt kind of lazy and just so not it just a very different personality from what the original film was. So I found that to be kind of strange. Maybe it was lack of budget. I don't know. Um, I think Chris Hemsworth was having a great time. I got a little bored with it, to be honest, after a while. I was like, okay, it's this crazy guy walking around and, you know, gradually getting more crazy. Um, but I did think it was cool to see the different, like, towns. There's, like, Gas Town, and I forget what the other two towns are, but kind of seeing the politics behind the scenes of who's the head of each one and how they interact with each other. Um, to be honest, I wish there was more of that. I think the Furiosa storyline was... I mean, obviously that's what the movie was about, but I don't know. It just, it was fine. I think I should watch it again because maybe I just didn't have the right expectations going in. But if it is the same feeling the second time as I had the first time, I'm very like, okay, this movie's fine. It's fine. So those are my thoughts on Furiosa Mad Max Saga. Yeah, actually, since we're on that, I also saw Furiosa, I think, a little bit later in my timeline, but I'll, I'll just talk about my thoughts Didn't you now. see it more than once? Or no? Um, no, I think... No, I only saw it once. Okay. I liked it a lot more than you did, though. Okay. Um, I definitely considered seeing it a second time. Um, yeah, I, I liked it quite a bit. I definitely, like... No, no question, the first one is much better, and... I think it really suffers in comparison with the first one. I think I think it works a lot better if you're able to disconnect it from the first one a little bit more and just mm-hmm. view it on its own as a lower budget movie that still has some really stunning action sequences and some great acting and some great world building. Um, it's you know the 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 first one is like a a culture defining right. like masterpiece of cinema you know right. <laughs> but as we talked about in our mad max episode i appreciate fury road fury road isn't really a movie for me in the sense of like it doesn't it's not a movie that i go back to all the time and in the same way that it is for some other people which i think is probably why i responded to furiosa as much as i i did It had a little bit, Furiosa had a little bit more of the elements that I really enjoy in a sci-fi movie. It had a bit more world building. It had a bit more kind of plot. You know, there's like lore, there's um, events spanning years, there's a little bit more digging into characters and how they change over time. And um, again, it's not better than Fury Road. Fury Road is still the far superior movie but I just responded personally to Furiosa a little bit more um yeah I really liked it I definitely agree there's some dodgy CGI but I think some of the action sequences are just among some of the best of this year or maybe even in the past five years the um the sequence in um I think it's gas town Mm -hmm. (laughs) which town is it I know it's it's not the bullet farm it's gas town right um with the giant big rig truck and her and um oh gosh what's his name the Tom Burke character Mm -hmm. um where she's like she's going to escape but then he gets trapped and so she goes back to rescue him and they're like just going through there's oh 
it was it's stunning it's absolutely stunning some of the the camera work and the choreography and the bl- blocking in that sequence um same with the sequence i think a little bit earlier where these like flying guys who are attacking their rig and they have to keep like shooting them off and yeah there's just some really incredible action that i i really really appreciated in it um i think anya taylor joy you know for a character that has like maybe 20 lines of dialogue in the entire movie i think she's very good this is the second I love- time the title character d- like Speaks the least out of everybody. Right, yeah. <laughs> Carrying on the proud Mad Max tradition. Her, like, sort of wordless friend, but also maybe romantic chemistry with Tom Burke, I think is really wonderful. I really love Chris Hemsworth in this movie. For me, he didn't get old because it's just, you know, we're so used to seeing Chris Hemsworth in his Thor mode and seeing him just absolutely having a blast being a totally charismatic evil character who just gets more and more deranged and unhinged like that whole um this whole idea of someone who does really well as the charismatic member of a biker gang but once he actually has to settle down and like deal with administrative issues and politics he's like terrible he's at like, it I don't know and what he to just do. <laughs> he doesn't understand like i why can't i make people do what i want why why do things keep going to shit um yeah he's he's great um so anyway, I don't want to speak for too long, but yeah, I also saw Furiosa. I liked it quite a bit. Um, not as good as the original, but still, still very good. Yeah. Oh, I should probably go next. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Two other things that I uh, saw this year. I saw the film Ninotchka from 1939. This is a comedy by Ernst Lubitsch, who's the same guy who did... Um, Shop Around the Corner. If you remember, we did an episode on Shop Around the Corner. He's a European director from the 20s, 30s, 40s who came to work in America and is just really known for these very um, witty, sophisticated comedies. Um, And Ninochka is significant because it stars Greta Garbo, who is a huge, huge star in the 20s and 30s. And her whole, she was a a Swedish um, actress who was working in the United States and her whole persona, her whole thing was that she's always sad. She's always crying. She's always dying or her love interest is dying on her. Like things are always bad for her. And her like catchphrase was, I want to be alone. I want to be alone. Just leave me alone. <laughs> so We've in this movie. We've all been there. We've all yeah. been <laughs> So at this time, late 30s, her career is kind of, um, you know, it's kind of struggling a little bit. People are starting to. Like her movies aren't doing as well. And so this was very much a career rebrand for her because this is a romantic comedy. And the tagline for this movie was Garbo laughs. Oh, like, we've never seen Greta Garbo laugh on screen before. Can you imagine? And it's just it's a real delight. It really is. She plays this um, very like severe um agent of the Soviet Union who sent to France to negotiate like the the sale of some jewels or something like that. Um, and she meets this, like, um, I guess American French sort of expat who's like living in France. He's a real, you know, he's like charming and witty and sophisticated. He's kind of a playboy. He instantly falls for her and keeps like, you know, he's pursuing her and she's attracted to him and she doesn't want to admit it. But then she finally like, you know, he like falls over really embarrassingly and she just like breaks out and starts laughing and it's just the most adorable thing ever um Ninochka is a really really delightful movie it's so the chemistry between the two of them is so good especially because um the guy who plays the love interest honestly I don't even remember his name he's good but good in a way where it's like you know he's kind of charming a little bit bland he's just kind of there but you can tell the actor knows his job in this movie is to prop up Greta Garbo and to be the one supporting her so that she can shine. And he does it so well. And she just absolutely shines. She's so radiant and adorable in this movie. And um, yeah, I had a great time with it in Ochka. Sounds like you really liked it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. And then let's see. The last one that I will talk about for the moment is... Um, oh, another rom-com. I rewatched Roxanne, which is a late 80s rom-com starring Steve Martin and Daryl Hannah. It's an adaptation of the Cyrano story, uh, Cyrano de Bergerac, but with a happy ending. 
um steve My martin le- is oh I, yeah i yeah i know that you the storyline of cyrano <laughs> frustrates me so much uh the premise in this movie is that steve martin is like the f- is the fire chief in this little small town i think maybe like upper sort of pacific north northwest um town uh, he's the the fire chief in a town where the the volunteer firefighting department is absolutely terrible, and he keeps trying to whip them into shape, and they're all <laughs> they're all just constantly failing. Um, but he's like, you know, he's this really, you know, he's he's nineteen eighty Steve Martin. He's confident. He's he's charming. He has white he hair has and looks talents. like he's sixty he's years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but he has this really long nose, you know, as Cyrano's typically do, and he's very self conscious about it. Uh, Anytime someone says something about it, he gets really bad. And then Daryl Hannah, who's the Roxanne character, moves into town. She's beautiful. She's smart. She's a grad student who's trying to, like, discover some asteroid or something. Um, And she has a crush on one of his volunteer firefighters who's really handsome but doesn't know how to talk to her. And so, you know, Steve Martin, the Cyrano character, is helping him try and talk to Roxanne. But actually, he loves Roxanne. Classic, classic it's just such a charming movie. It really is. If you've never seen it, highly, highly recommend. Roxanne. Yeah. Fun movie. All right. Um, so coming back to me, I'm going to do three more. The next three are gay movies because I there are so many gay films out there that people just don't watch. And I'm on this goal. Like on, I have this goal to watch all of these movies and share them with people because they're worth seeing, but they're just not well known. Um, well, two of these are actually relatively well known, but the first one I had never heard of. Um, my friend recommended it to me and we actually watched it together. It's called Tu Wong Fu. Thanks for everything. Julie. Oh, I've actually heard of this one. <laughs> yes, it is. I've been meaning to watch it. It is such a charming, wholesome, beautiful, hilarious film It came out in 1995, and it essentially follows these three drag queens, but they're trans women. They are seen as drag queens in this movie because it was 1995, and people were not ready for for trans women. But that that's that's who they are. Um, But anyway, you have Patrick Swayze dressed in drag. You have Wesley Snipes dressed in drag and you have John Leguizamo dressed in drag. It's incredible. Um, So this is a movie where you watch it and as time goes on, you're like, wait a minute, what what actually is the plot of this? Like, what is happening? Where are they going? Like, we don't really know. Essentially, they just hop in a car and they drive somewhere and then they break down and they end up in this town with all it's like this very small town in the middle of nowhere with all of these people who very clearly have like never been exposed to queer people before and it's them moving into this place and especially essentially just like bringing love and beauty into this community of people who like there's some people that are filled with a lot of hatred or some people that are just like bored out of their minds or whatever and there's a lot of um again like all of these things I'm talking about, I watched months ago. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. I'm trying to just capture the overall themes. I might get some of the details wrong, but it just, Patrick, the thing that makes this movie work is all of these leading men of Patrick Swayze, Wesley Snipes, and John Leguizamo, they commit to their roles. And in a way that is so respectful to people in these sorts of situations they're not making a joke out of it they're not like these are real people and they communicate their stories in such a sensitive loving sort of way um so it's literally just these three drag queens slash trans women arrive in this small town in the middle of nowhere and by the end of the movie everyone is running around the town basically holding all of these things representing like love is beautiful and love doesn't like love saves lives and love is the reason we exist and people should just love who they want to love because love is beautiful and just like love makes life perfect (laughs) like it's just this really it's just a really wholesome beautiful film so unfortunately that's as specifically I can talk about it right now because it's been a while um can I just say 
Patrick Swayze, what an incredible talent who we lost far too soon. I remember someone once said, like, he's one of those rare stars who could be equally sort of comfortable and make equal sense in really macho, masculine, like, action movies and also more, you know, romantic dramas, musicals, and then obviously, you know, being able to commit to a role like this. Just what a range he had, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's it's incredible. This is definitely going to be one of my new feel-good movies. Like, if I'm ever just in a bad mood, just pop this baby on because it's it's so... It just lifts your spirits and gives you hope for humanity <laughs> and just makes you think about love and loving people. And if we all just loved each other, the world would be a better place. <laughs> Life is not that simple, but this movie communicates that it is, and I love to live in that sort of world, even if it's only for an hour and a half. Um, <clears throat> so that's Tu Wong Fu. Thanks for everything. Um, the next movie I watched is Rustin. It is a Netflix film um, about Bayard Rustin, who was an activist that basically helped lead um, the biggest civil rights march in the history of the United States. Um, and... I won't go into the huge details of it. I will say that it is a film that is a very typical biopic that's also made by Netflix. So, like, it's very visually frustrating because you can tell that they're just like, crank up the saturation and make it look clear in 4K. And we're not going to really think about anything beyond that in terms of the visuals. So it's very visually kind of bland. Um and again, it's very typical biopic format. There are lots of things about Bayard Rustin that are um, potentially problematic that they don't dive into because they want it to be kind of a very, um, like, positive um, take on, on this person's life, which there are a lot of positive things about him. I didn't, I honestly didn't know anything about him. And so that is the reason that I am grateful that this movie exists, because is it a typical biopic? yes. But also it teaches you about a person that is very important and very influential in the history of the civil rights movement in this country. And he was a gay man who also was a black man during this time. And just hearing about his struggles and him kind of hiding his identity and then some people knowing and other people not knowing and how that fits into the politics of trying to get funding from white people in the government to do these things. Um, and... Yeah, it's 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 very good. Also, like Coleman Domingo, like he he's really having a a, sur a resurgence right now. Like I I'm here for his renaissance. He's incredible. Um, he's such a talented actor. So for the sake of what this movie is trying to do, I think this movie is literally only trying to teach you that this man existed and this is what he did. And in that sense, it accomplishes its goal. If you're looking for something that's very original and visually stimulating that's not the case here um but he's important to learn about so yeah that is rustin um and then the next one i will talk about again another movie with gay people is called bound i've heard of this one as well the wachowski sisters right yes th this is one of the best movies i've ever seen bound is so good it's been on a list of movies for me to watch for years but I finally sat down to watch it and I, I the way that this movie sets up the plot of the film because you kind of go into it and you're like okay it's kind of like a like a lesbian maybe heist movie where they're like trying to you know get what pull one over on the big guys and get this money and escape and go on this like you know, this road trip for love and escape all of the, you know, the their pasts of where they came from. You kind of go in and you think that that's what it is. And it is that, but it's also so much more because the way that this movie adds all of these unexpected, you know, like different, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? All of these unexpected directions that it goes and adds on to this very like, you know, already cliche, determined, like, we know how these stories go, but it adds all of these twists and turns in the middle, and the way that this film builds tension is some of the best I've ever seen. Like, it just keeps going, and there are so many times throughout this film where you're like, how much deeper can we go into this? Like, how are they going to get out of this? There's no way they're going to get out of this. 
and then you think they're going to get out of it and then something else happens. You're like, what? No, no. Like it just keeps racking and racking and racking up the tension. Um, the performances are great. Um, you know, we, Joe, what's his name? Joe Pontaliano, who is also in the matrix. He's such a good bad guy. And in this movie, he's like this, this stressed out husband who's like in the, in the mob. And like, it's just, I, I'm not doing a very good job describing this film because again, I watched it a long time ago, but the feeling has stuck with me. It's incredible. I immediately recommended it to my friend who watched it and texted me constantly and was like, Oh my god, like this is so good. I'm so ah, I'm so stressed out. The tension. This is so highly recommend it. This is a movie that it, I think people know about it, but I don't know how widely that net has been cast. So if you have not seen this movie, I would highly 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 recommend it. I think I watched it again on Max. I don't know if it's still there, but it is Bound, directed by the Wachowskis. Please check it out. It's it's very, very, very good. All right. Um, okay. So the first one I have to talk about next is um, a uh, like a, a best picture winner um, that I was trying to catch up on. It's called The English Patient mm. from 1996. Mm-hmm. Problematic I film. Uh, y- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't quite sure what to expect with this. I was sort of like, oh, you know, super long, like... Miramax, you know, period drama from the 90s kind of looks boring, but I'll give it a chance. <laughs> when I tell you, okay, so in Seinfeld, lay there's it like on a us, running Geneva, joke. Please lay it on us. <laughs> in Seinfeld, there's a running joke about how Elaine hates the English patient and everyone around her loves it and yep. she can't understand. I am so with Elaine. This movie is not good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I really disliked it. I don't think people really like it anymore. I don't know what happened yeah, in ha- that year think, specifically, but... Yeah, I think it might be one of those, like, it was huge at the time, but it has not really held up or not lingered as much. I mean, I don't think it's quite... It's not quite on the level of something like American Beauty, where a lot of people now just, like, actively hate it. I don't see a whole lot of active hatred for it. I think it's more like... Oh, yeah, that was a good movie, but I'm not really actively thinking about it. I could be totally wrong about this. Let me tell you, (laughs) I don't think it's... I just just really dislike this movie. It is... It's so long. Did you watch it it in one sitting? I think so. Wow. Yeah. It is so long when it does not need to be. The plot does not at all bear up, like, the, the, the length. Um, the love, the main love story, I mean, Ray Fiennes, Kristen Scott Thomas, absolutely gorgeous, brilliant actors, but I was not in any way invested in their love story. Um, <coughs> it's, I don't, I, I don't even have a lot to say about <laughs> this. I just really disliked it. I'm glad that I have seen it and I can cross it off my list, but I'm, I have no intention of ever watching mm-hmm. it again. It was very disappointing to me. All right. All right. A movie that I did like a lot more is a drama from 1949 called All the King's Men, which I think is also a Best Picture winner. I think that's why I watched it. This movie, in my opinion, is very, very good and really does hold up. It's a sort of political drama about a man who's like a sort of folksy small town lawyer who like seems to have kind of integrity. He's... He's trying to stand up to the big financial interests in his small town. And there's a reporter who's kind of uh, following him and is sort of supporting him. But then as this like folksy lawyer starts to gain more power and he gains this like very populist uh, following, he starts to change and he becomes corrupt and he becomes um, bullying and demanding. And, you know, he's maintaining this populist facade and people still love him. But everyone who actually is around him and who knows him knows that actually he is taking bribes. He's using all of these, you know, perks of his station to get the things that he wants. He's pulling strings so that, like, at some point his um, sort of late teens, early 20s son has a scandal where he drives drunk and a girl is killed. And he uses all his connections to cover that up. Like, wow, things things never change, you know. Um And so it's the reason it's called All the King's Men is it's because it's the story of this man, but it's also the story of this reporter and some of his friends 
um, who are in this politician circle and are basically seeing themselves become enablers of who he is and are facing the, this crisis of conscience, but also are, you know, tempted by the perks that they're receiving. You know, they're receiving all this protection and money and all of these benefits of being in his inner circle. And um, so, you know, it's a movie from 1949. So it's about a political situation that is not, you know, a one-to-one -one ratio of what's um, like similarity to what's happening today. But there's a lot that is really recognizable and universal about just human, you know, the human desire for power, or the way that we can be tempted and seduced by um, someone promising us all of the things that we want. And the the lead um, actor, the, the politician who becomes corrupt is Broderick Crawford, who was um, the following year in Born Yesterday, which is a movie we did an episode on. Uh, I think he's wonderful in Born Yesterday. I think he's really wonderful here. He really does the transformation well, where he starts out as someone you really like and want to root for. And then over time, you're like, oh, oh, no. <laughs> oh, this guy's kind of a monster, <laughs> you know. Um, so, yeah, All the King's Men. It's not a movie that I see talked about very much nowadays, but I I really think it's worth a, a, a watch if you're interested in that um, subject matter. Um, and then finally, I'll just say very briefly, I had the opportunity to watch Spider-Man 1 and 2, which were re-released into theaters around me back in April. And what an absolute joy that was. I've seen both of those movies so many times, but I had never been able to see them in theaters. I was a little bit too young when they first came out. And they're just, they're such good movies. They're great crowd pleasers, but there's some really, really, I think, excellent filmmaking the writing for these films is so good. The The characters are so human and lived in. And, um, you know, they have some really complex emotional situations in ways that you don't normally see with superhero movies today. I mean, I love a lot of the Marvel movies, but, you know, this is just kind of human and grounded in a completely different way. And Spider-Man 2 in particular, I know if <laughs> I know Tatum doesn't agree with me and that's fine. It's one of my favorite films of all time. And in particular, because there are these two really emotional scenes of characters extending, um, characters being in really difficult circumstances and choosing to extend grace to one another, when that is a very difficult thing to do. And it just moves me so much. You know, Spider-Man 2 is very much a movie about how do we live as good people in a world that keeps beating down on us, a world that's constantly unfair. And how do we still get up and find motivation and find inspiration every day? And it's just, yeah, a movie that I really, really love. And I think has a lot of good messages in addition to just being really, you know, fun, well-made action movie. So, yeah. If I didn't boycott Marvel, I would watch that movie again and see if I would have a different take on it. But alas. Yeah. To be fair, I think they might be have been, I mean, this was pre-MCU. So they might have been actually Sony productions rather than like, you know, what is event, what is now Disney Marvel. That's true. That's true. Um, in which case, I'm going to rewatch all of them. No. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I'm actually going to kind of bounce off of that a little bit and talk about yeah. another movie that was re-released in theaters um, after, obviously, being released years ago, um, which Geneva and I have talked about this. If, if movie theaters are, quote unquote, dying... Like, we should just be re-releasing old films in theaters. There's definitely an audience for that. Um, but anyway. Yeah, that audience is me. Like, yeah. Please re-release everything. And lots I want to go see it. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's tangent. But a movie that I saw in theaters that was being re-released is Shrek 2. Because it was the 20th anniversary of the film. And wow. I went with a childhood friend. She was my neighbor growing up. Because her and I, we we would quote this movie all the time when we were little. And so it was really fun to go see it with her in theaters. Um, it, yeah. I mean, a lot of people have seen Shrek too. It definitely earns its spot on the list of like best sequels ever made. It really was just a lot better than I remembered. It has a really great message. Basically it's a commentary in my opinion you could interpret it as a commentary on racism and or homophobia. This context of bringing your partner home to meet your parents and they're kind of like 
this creature is not someone that we want for you. Like they're gross. They don't fit in. They're not what we wanted for you. It's unexpected. Um, and kind of just like seeing the journey of the in-laws, particularly Fiona's father, come to accept that, you know, the fact that his daughter loves someone that is in his mind a beast, like that is more important than him trying to set her up with Prince Charming. Like, I just think it's a really, really great message, um, aside from the fact that, like, it's just funny and well animated and has, like, an incredible montage at the end with a great song. <laughs> like, it's just, it's very, very good. I was thrilled to see it again in theaters. It was a very good time. Um, it was a theater. It was not filled because, I mean, it was only re-released for a couple days and we went to see it on, like, a Tuesday night or something. So it wasn't a full theater, but... Of the people that were there, it was all millennials and one child. <laughs> so, so it was great. Um, but yeah, that, that tracks. That yeah. makes sense to me. <laughs> Go rewatch Shrek too, guys. It's a great film. Um, and then, yes, another film that I watched completely by chance was the film Luca, um, because I I took an edible and I was like, I want to watch something with colors and like weird fish things, and I was like, sure, let's put on Luca. I've never seen it. Luca is one of the gayest movies I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it's like these little, th just these little fish people and like other people and all of this just like, like you can't call it sexual tension because you, they're, I feel like almost a little bit too young, but they're, you can just tell that these three kids, that it's very like, there's a lot of longing looks and soft touches on the shoulder and just like drama between it's just I, I and that's not even my interpretation I feel like that's literally what the movie is but Disney and Pixar can't explicitly say that that's what it is um but it's a very cute film it's very um I feel like I've been very disappointed with Pixar the last five years or so um, but this movie was very enjoyable. Is it groundbreakingly original? No, but it's 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 a fun time. You can show it to your kids. It's very, you know, it's got good themes. It's got beautiful colors and animation. Um, and like, I would much prefer that to a questionably necessary sequel to a previous <laughs> Pixar film, um, which is a lot of what they're doing these days. So that is Luca. It's very, very good. Um, yeah, recommend. And then I think I said two films, so I'll do one more. Um, the next film, kind of taking a big turn, this movie is a little bit um, kind of depressing and sad, but it's called Short Term 12. It's been on my list for a very long time. It came out in 2013. I've wanted to see it ever since I saw um, Room, when Room came out, because Brie Larson, I was so impressed by her performance in that movie. Um, she's such a talented actress and I will forever be upset that she's now been put into this box of like this Marvel character because a lot of people are like she sucks at acting and I'm like no sh she doesn't she's actually very talented but yeah anyway yeah. Um, I knew her first for the record from Community where she yes. had a great couple of episodes <laughs> yes absolutely I forgot Love Brie about Larson. that I forgot about that um but yes, so it's essentially about um, Brie Larson's character. Her name is Grace, and she is, I don't know the technical term. It might be a social worker. I don't know the official term, but she essentially works at like a center for um, young juveniles who are, um, are they orphans or just like abandoned by their parents or, or something like that? They're, they're just children that are living in this place and they don't have any parental figures and they're just looked after by these, again, I think the term is social worker. Um, but it's just, yeah, it's just her like living this life with these kids and learning about the children's stories, but also seeing how like her past is kind of interwoven with theirs and how that made her passionate about taking care of these kids. And then you see how, her past affects her current relationship and her trauma and all of those things. Um, so it's kind of a downer of a film, but I will say, you know, we've got young Rami Malek, which is very interesting kind of playing this like 
this new social worker who's never done it before and he comes in and he's kind of like yes i'm going to save children's lives and then he's like oh wait a minute like this is not what i expected like i feel kind of out of my element i don't know what to do but the main thing to talk about here is lakeith stanfield this is one of his this actually i think might be his debut performance on the large screen in a feature film I have no words from the like the fact that this is his first performance you can tell that he has been an absolute magician and master of an actor from the very beginning he gives the performance of this film it, it is so powerful and so it draws you in and makes you feel so much for his character, his facial expressions, his his body language, like how he interacts with Brie Larson's character. I mean, I would watch it just for him alone. Like his performance is astounding. Um, but him alongside, you know, Brie Larson and the other performances here, it's just a great it's a very good film. Um, and yeah, I. I'm glad I watched it. Um, it's been on my list for a very long time, and it's finally checked off. I'm glad I watched it. That's awesome. I feel like short term, short term ten to me is twelve. Short term twelve is one of those movies that I always see talked about in the context of look at this movie that has so many people before mm -hmm. they were stars, yep. but not really in any other context. So I've always been very curious about it. Uh, I'll need to check it out as well. It's a good movie. Um, let's see. So this over the, the summer, I read a book called um, Easy Riders Raging Bulls, which is all about the start of the new Hollywood and kind of some of the prominent figures in it. So this is the late 1960s into the 1970s. These are people like Robert Altman, um, Martin Scorsese, Warren Beatty, um, Dennis Hopper, like just kind of all of those people who were involved in the shift in Hollywood out of the sort of flower, flower power um, into more of the, um, the, the very subversive, the sometimes like paranoid like trends in the 1970s. Um, it was a really interesting book. I have some, it, it had a very gossipy tone in some <laughs> points which I was like, hmm, I don't know about this. Um, but it was really fascinating. But anyway, I'm just saying that because I watched several films that are sort of classics of the 1970s that I had just never gotten around to. So very quickly, I'm just going to kind of go through them all. Um, let me see. I watched Taxi Driver mm. for the first time. Excellent. <laughs> I don't think it's controversial to say excellent, mm. excellent movie. But And something that is continues to be so incredibly relevant. Like, I don't know how Martin Scorsese and I think it was Paul Schrader who wrote it were able to just instantly create this archetype of the loner disaffected kind of incel -y character who you sort of pity and are fascinated by but are also repelled by and you know that he's going to do something horrible you just don't know what like it's just such an instantly iconic archetype and the film establishes it so well great movie um i watched mash which is robert altman film from 1970 did not i understand why this movie is was as sort of singular and new as it was you know this sort of very darkly satirical we're going to make a comedy out of like the horrors of wartime is you know it, it's it's a brilliant idea but this movie is just so sexist i just i've really really struggled with it like you know the whole time we're supposed to be laughing at elliot gould's and Donald Sutherland just terrorizing the nurses around them and I'm just like I I don't find this funny or charming no. I'm, I'm sorry I really don't um don't so. apologize for that <laughs> <laughs> thank you I knew you would have heard me oh of yeah. course <laughs> yeah um symbol well shampoo is the next one that I watched with Warren Beatty where he's just you know kind of playing a variation on himself as like a huge womanizer who's bouncing balancing multiple women and kind of failing and um keeping any one of them happy because he cannot stop doing what he's doing it was an interesting movie um i didn't fully i'm still 
kind of chewing on it in some ways because I feel like I don't really know how much the movie wants me to sympathize. Like I, I, if the movie is being very critical of him, then I 100%, you know, am for it. I don't know. It was an interesting movie. It's very much a portrait of the time, which I, I found really interesting. And it's got, you know, Julie Christie is great in it. Um, uh, what, oh, gosh, I'm blanking on her name. Um, and it, everyone who's in it is is very, very good in it. Um, but yeah, it, it is a little hard to watch at times because you're just like, stop being such a, a jerk to all the women in your life. Anyway, um, let's see. The Deer Hunter I mm. watched... This was a very different movie than what I was expecting. Less of it, it takes place in Vietnam than what... I thought the whole thing was a Vietnam story. It's actually the first half is these friends in this small, I think, like Pennsylvania um, mining or factory town. And then they go to Vietnam and then there's sort of an aftermath as they're dealing with the psychological trauma and fallout of that. Um, it is... It's very good. I wouldn't say it's like absolute top tier greatness of the 70s, but it's very good. It's very, um, it's very sort of novelistic in the sense of like, I don't know, it's very poetic in certain ways. Um, the, the romance between um, Robert De Niro and Meryl Streep I thought was really, really beautifully understated. Um, Christopher Walken is great. Yeah, I, I enjoyed this movie a lot more than I thought I was going to, to be honest. Uh, let's see. Manhattan. Um, mm. Interesting movie. We uh, love Woody Allen. problematic elements. We love yeah. Woody Allen. Yeah. Um, the man yeah, who I, has I'll... the best and the healthiest perspectives of women. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Not not going to talk too much about that one. Um, oh, <laughs> Three Days of the Condor, 1975, Robert Redford. Excellent, excellent movie. This was one that I was supposed to watch for a film class in college, and I didn't because it was toward the end of the semester, and I was overwhelmed. And now I finally caught up with it. Okay. <laughs> great movie. It's a thriller about a CIA agent who, um, well, he's not even a CIA agent. He's an analyst. He's not trained for the field. He's just good at, like, observing things and reading patterns. But then his office is hit. He's the only one who is spared because he just happened to be out of the office at the time. All of a sudden, the CIA think he is the one who or ordered the hit. And so he's on the run. Turns out there's corruption within the CIA. He's trying surprise, to figure out who surprise. he can trust. Yep. Faye Dunaway is like a random woman he picks up off the street. And um, sort of Stockholm syndromes are into helping him. Um, it's, a, it's a really, really well done film. It's just... That whole, like, 70s post-Watergate, like, we can't trust any institution, everyone is bad, there's nowhere to turn, that kind of existential hopelessness is, like, very much present here. <laughs> it's done very well. <laughs> and then lastly, again, very briefly, Nashville, also a Robert Alt Altman film, but I liked much, much better than Nash. I really, really loved Nashville. It's a... Um, I don't know what the term is, but it's one of those films where there's a bazillion different characters that all have their own storylines. Sometimes they intersect. Sometimes they're off on their own. And then it all kind of culminates in the end mm. with this kind of, I, I don't want to spoil it, but like really prescient <laughs> thing that happens that, you know, you watch it in the 21st century and you're like, oh, wow, this is kind of just foreseeing so much about how modern fame operates, you know, streaks of... Um, hatred and violence and and madness that run through our culture um it's an yeah it's an excellent film so many recognizable actors just giving great performances um great some great you know country music if i'm not the biggest country music person but i like the music in this movie um yeah i would definitely recommend nashville so that's it that's my 1970s run from the summer the 1970s, man, so many great movies came out oh in the 70s. Goodness. I mean, a, absolutely insane. A lot of people say that the 70s is the best decade of film. And I'm like, pound for pound. I mean, I'm like, I kind of agree. Strong argument to be made. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my heart is always going to be more in the 40s. But yeah, strong argument to be made for the 70s. Yeah. Um. OK, three more for me. Um. OK, I, you know, let's get some straight people in here. I rewatched the movie Bright Star. Um, I, it is for some reason a forgotten Jane Campion film. 
I don't really know why that is because I think it's one of her best. Um, it's like up there for me. It's either her number one or her number two. It's very much so that one and um, uh, the power of the dog. The two of them are very competitive to, to me in my brain. Um, but this movie is magical. It's just, it takes the feeling of love and your heart and everyone's heart and just lays it bare on the screen. <laughs> like, it's just, I am not. It is a John Keats romantic poem turned into visuals and it's, sound. It's amazing. It's it's an incredible film. I, I watched it for the first time a few years ago. And ever since then, I've been like waiting to watch it again. But I wanted to make sure it was far enough away that I could still enjoy the experience. And I'd be like, oh, I just watched this. Um, it, the cinematography, the production design, the costume design, the acting performances, the writing, the pacing, the editing. Like I said before, I don't understand why this movie is lesser known or lesser like renowned in Jane Campion's filmography. Um, but it's just a, a beautiful, heartbreaking, yet swooning, heart filling, <laughs> like, story of love between these two people that are just in love and there's something so special about it I'm very nitpicky when it comes to romance movies in a lot of ways now I understand why but um I just it's very hard for me to get into stories where people fall in love very fast I'm like this doesn't make sense like you're not gonna want to die for somebody if you've only known them for two days like that's not how this works but this movie, for whatever reason, like, obviously it happens over time, but it does kind of feel like something where they fall very deeply in love in so somewhat quickly. And, see, like, ugh, I just, I could go on and on. I'm not going to do that. We will have an episode of Bright Star on this podcast at some point, whether Geneva chooses it or I choose it. We will talk about it in depth on this podcast. Um, but if you are a Jane Campion fan and you have not heard of this movie, please go watch it. Um, it's very impressive, and it's quite an achievement. And, um, yeah, just wanted to mention Bright Star. Another movie I watched was a rewatch. It is another movie that Geneva really liked as well. It's called The Worst Person in the World. It is a Norwegian film that came out 2021, 20, I think. Um, gosh, it, uh, what a time. it it is such a challenging relatable reflection on what it means to be a young adult who's kind of transitioning out of being a young adult and just this meditation on like how do you even figure out what you want to do with your life because you could do anything but also none of it matters but does it matter it's over so quickly. So what do we do with our time? Like, we have to figure it out if our time is limited. But how do, you know, and it's just a very, it, yeah, it's just very challenging, very existential in a way that's uncomfortable, but relatable. So if you are having an existential crisis and you want to feel seen, watch this movie. If you are in an existential crisis and you feel like you're in a dark place, do not watch this movie. <laughs> Um, we desperately need to do an episode on this movie as well. I it's on really my list. Rewatch it. Yeah, yeah, it's on my list. I found it interesting. Like this is something that I did not connect with last time because uh, romance was not really a part of my life at all. But I found it very interesting. This concept that I did not notice as much last time. But I forget the main character's names. But she basically enters into this relationship with this man who's older than her. Not that much older, maybe like 10 years, but she's in her early 20s, early to mid 20s, and he's in his early to mid 30s, and they're together for quite some time. And I really connected with this idea of she breaks up with him because she's like, you're the only person I've really ever been with. And like, I love you, but I also want to explore and see if there's something else out there that's potentially better, because how can I know if you're right for me if you're the only person I've ever been with. And then he essentially tells her, like, I understand your desire and I respect it, but I also know that given my age and what I've been through, 
the connection that we have is not a connection that you find every day. Like this is something that is unique and is special, but you can't see it, but I can. So it's just this really, uh, I, yeah, just the way that that dynamic is kind of navigated and drawn out. And then you see just the decisions that she makes. Sometimes it's like, why are you making this decision? But if I were in your position, I would do the same thing. Like, it's just, uh, yeah. Uh, like Geneva said, we will talk about this on the podcast at some point, but it is the worst person in the world. Um, I stand by what I said. If you're in an existential crisis, existential crisis and you want to feel seen, watch this movie. If you're in an existential crisis and you are depressed and in a bad place, do not watch this movie. I think about without giving any spoilers as to context, the speech that Anders Danielson Lee gives about sort of physical objects, physical Stop. media. I'm going to start crying. You memory, can't. I, looking back on his life, like, so frequently. Ugh. Like, it's just an all-time, like, it really, really I'm literally me. tearing up. Like, I, <laughs> like, I can't. All right, move on. Moving it's, on. Moving on. Oh, <laughs> it's so good. It, like, so I'm, good. I'm literally tearing up. Okay, I'm going to move on, and I am going to lift myself up out of that place by talking about a movie called Girl Trash. It's called Girl Trash All Night Long. <laughs> it is one of the worst movies I've ever seen <laughs> in my life, but yes. in a way that makes it the best thing ever. Like I invited friends over because I had seen the trailer for this movie and I was like, I know exactly what it is and this is what I need in my life. It is literally girl trash, but like a bunch of lesbians and it's them just like going out and just like I don't know it's I can't even remember what it's about because it's so stupid and it's also a musical and let me just give you an idea one of the songs in the movie is I don't remember the melody but it's don't shit on my dream it's just my fantasy and it that's the entire song but it's sung over and over again of don't shit on my dream. It's just my fantasy. Don't shit on my dream. It's just like, it's just like over and <laughs> over and over again. And it comes up at multiple times in the movie. And it's just like, who is the main character? Who are we rooting for? Should we be rooting for any of these people? Like, it's just, it's, it's, it's so bad. And it's so silly. And it's just so campy and so dumb. The fact that it's a musical makes it so much better. <laughs> like, we were, who did I, I think I watched this with three people. There was this one part where all of us were like, wait a minute, is this movie, like, low-key racist? Because there's this one character who shows up, and I'm pretty sure her name is, like, I think her name is Monique Shaniqua Jones. And <laughs> she's, like, the one black person in the movie. She's like, hi, my name is Monique Shaniqua Jones. And it's like, um, <laughs> this is problematic but then you see that like the writer and director of the movie is a black woman so it's like does that make it okay like we don't we feel kind of weird about this because she's literally just a black character who shows up to like she like goes in and out of jail like three times and every time she comes out of jail she's like i'm gonna go like fuck up some shit like it's just it's the movie is outrageous. It's so over the top. It's so dumb. It's such a it's such a fun time. So if you ever want to just have a time where you invite your friends over and you all just want to watch something stupid and laugh together, highly highly recommend Girl Trash all night long. This is going to become a new annual tradition for me and I cannot wait to watch it again next year. <laughs> so that's Girl all right, Trash then. all night long. Highly recommend. Is that a recent movie? Is it older? Oh, I think it's I based on the wardrobe. I think it's like early to mid 2000s. OK, OK. Yeah. Something about the way you were describing it made me think like, oh, I could see this movie being like a, you know, a small indie sort of streamer hit or something from just the last few years. It's but, definitely okay. a small indie, but yeah. Okay. All right. Um, first of all, I realized when I was going through my the 70s run that I completely for skipped over The Godfather Part 2. <laughs> I watched The Godfather Part 2 for the first mm. time. No surprise. Great movie. Didn't really like... It wasn't like 
sort of personally moving to me. I was just like, okay, it's a great movie. I've seen it now. Mm -hmm. Um, But anyway, I just wanted to mention it. Um, Okay, so over the summer, um, as I did last year, I went to the Provincetown Film Festival in Cape Cod. um, And I saw three films uh, there that I did want to talk about. The first is called Girls Will Be Girls. Um, It's a film by an Indian filmmaker. It is mostly in English, but it takes place in India. Um, And basically, it's about a girl who's at a boarding school. Her mom, her parents live close by. She has kind of a a mom who's um, like sort of arrested development, like... You don't get the full story, but you get the sense that her mom married kind of a little (laughs) Lorelai Gilmore situation. Like the mom may have gotten married and had her a little bit too young. And so she's sort of vicariously living out her youth through her daughter. And then the daughter is at this age where she's like, you know, she's very responsible. She's got a she's a position in the student government. She's a role model for the other kids. But she's also getting to this age where, you know, she's developing or her discovering her sexuality. She's interested in boys. She's kind of wants to figure out how to rebel. But in this place um, where she also feels like she has an image and a role to maintain, this boarding school she goes to is very strict. You know, they girls and boys aren't supposed to mingle. Um, there's a lot of, you know, here's what your role is as a woman in this society, that sort of thing. Um I think this movie, I liked a lot of things about this movie. I think there are a lot of different themes and sort of storylines that it's trying to explore that I think didn't fully come together. I think maybe one or two elements of the film could have been stripped away and made the what, the central thing that the director is trying to say a little bit stronger. But the th- really notable thing about this film to me is the lead actress. Uh, she's an actress named uh, Preeti Panag- Panagrahi. I apologize, I'm probably mispronouncing that, but the lead actress of Girls Will Be Girls, she is so just absolutely arresting, charismatic, um, so expressive, um, you know, this teenage girl playing a teenage girl, and I I think she could be a huge star, (laughs) honestly, I think she's so good. I'm very excited to see what she does in the future. Um, So that's Girls Will Be Girls. Next is a movie called Ghost Light, and... Um, this is a movie that is, it's kind of the thing where the sort of bare outlines of the plot are pretty familiar. I've definitely seen movies and stories like it before, but I think it's just done in a very, um, it's just really, really well executed. The basic idea is that there's a family who is struggling with some sort of um, tragedy. We don't know the details at the beginning. We don't learn the full story until the end of the movie. But they're all kind of struggling with um, their emotions in different ways. The um, the mom is trying to be the peacemaker. The da- daughter's really rebellious and she's acting out. And the dad, who's like a construction worker, is just kind of isolating himself and burying himself and not he doesn't know how to express his emotions. Um, but then he one day stumbles across this like small local theater company that is putting on a production of um, a Shakespeare play. And he doesn't know anything about theater or Shakespeare, but he just sort of like stumbles into getting a role in this um, production. And then through that, and eventually his daughter, um, who's also really interested in theater, comes and um, is also, also has a role in this production. And just basically through the experience of doing theater together, they are able to start to move past some of their emotions, start to reconnect, start to, um, you know, deal with the the things they've been feeling um, and, you know, kind of reconnect as a family. And like I said, it's not, it's a familiar story. It's just, in my opinion, really, really beautifully done. Um, one of the things that's really notable about it is the mother, father, daughter at the center of the story are played by a real life mother, father, daughter. Like they are an acting family who are cast in this film they all fit their roles so well. I mean, I'm, I imagine they were kind of partly written to play to their strengths. But the father in p- particular, who's kind of the lead character, uh, the actor's name is uh, Keith Kupfer. He is just so wonderful. You know, he's, um, you know, kind of like a, a large guy, like graying hair. He's very convincing as a like blue collar construction worker. 
but his face is so expressive as he's kind of discovering aspects of himself, learning about ways to extend empathy and understanding for other people, learning how to be vulnerable with other people. Um, and yeah, it was, it, I just found it very, very uh, moving um, in the end. So yeah, Ghostlight. I would really recommend it, especially if you're interested in these idea of stories about how the sort of transformative power of art and theater um, to yeah be with us in our kind of daily lives. Can I just say that Ghostlight mm -hmm. is um, a film that is directed by a Chicago-based film director who oh. I actually know personally, so that's kind of <gasps> cool. Are you serious? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. What, uh, Alex Thompson? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. And I think I'd mentioned to you, too, Keith Kupfer, the, the lead actor, he was briefly in an episode of The Bear in season three. And I was I've, like, oh, hey, it's the guy from Ghostlight. <laughs> yeah, I've worked with him. He, he's he been on The Bear, and he also, um, I worked with him on a on a commercial with The Bear. Oh, that's so with cool. With The Bear Crew. Okay. That Coke commercial I worked on, like, last year. He was. Oh, gotcha. He okay. was, like, the, the, the lame dad who was like, welcome to the right. house. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Did you know that his wife and daughter also act? I did not, actually. I was not aware that the cast was an actual family. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Pretty, pretty cool. Um, okay, so the last one that I wanted to, that I saw at this film festival that I wanted to talk about is an absolutely delightful film that I've been just shouting from the rooftops to everyone that I meet. Please go watch Thelma. It's a movie called Thelma, starring June Squibb, a 93-year-old woman playing a 93-year-old woman named Thelma. The premise of the movie is that she is, um, her husband died a couple years ago, so she's kind of living alone in this big house. She has like a, um, like a children and then like this grandson who kind of comes in. He's like mid-20s, kind of directionless, doesn't really know what he wants to do with his life, but he really loves his grandmother and they spend a lot of time together. But then this woman, Thelma, she gets scammed um, by like a phone scam. She like, um, you know, gets scammed out of a few thousand dollars. And her kids are kind of really worried about her. And they're like, you know, maybe this is a sign that she shouldn't be on her own anymore. Maybe we should be thinking about moving her into a home, something like that. And she is very independent and she really feels ashamed by what happened and she wants to kind of prove herself. And so she goes on this revenge quest <laughs> with the help of one of her friends who was um, also I already in a uh, like an assisted living facility. And they go out on the town together to try and track down the person who scammed her and get the get the money back. And this movie is just absolutely delightful and such a like crowd pleaser. Like ev I, I can't see anyone disliking this movie. Like it is so beautiful and empathetic about the experience of aging and to the experience of you know what Thelma is thinking and feeling as it's like well all of a sudden the people that you you know have spent your life with are dying off and your body is changing you can't do the things that you could once before you need to be open to the idea of experiencing help or, or requesting help and um, just be kind of thinking about those you know those emotions but then it's also empathetic toward the experience of her children and grandchild as they're trying to figure out how do we help her how do we support her but how do we like you know make sure that she's getting the care that she needs um it's really it's I mean the acting is good it's very very funny <laughs> like it's just our theater was just absolutely rolling at so many sequences there's all this tension there are sort of action scenes although the action is very grounded because it's like you know oh no can this like 93 year old woman like stand up on a bed without breaking her head? <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's so good I really really loved it I got out of it and was like I need to call my grandmother right away um yeah I would just I would highly recommend it great great well well made movie Awesome. It's definitely on my list. Um, I look forward to seeing it. Um, okay, I'm going to say a couple movies here because some of them I don't really have that much to say. Um, I was recently on two long plane flights, and so I decided to rewatch Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban and Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. These movies are good. <laughs> like, like, 
I just haven't seen them in a long time. Um, and the ones that are most fresh in my memory are the first two because they play them every year for Christmas for some reason. And also the Deathly Hollows because those are the most recent. Um, I've kind of forgotten about the ones in the middle. These movies are really good. Um, and I'm, I don't know, I find myself particularly impressed with um, Daniel Radcliffe and Rupert Grint's performances. They both are very good actors from a young age and that carries throughout and I feel like as time goes on I become less and less impressed with Emma Watson (laughs) um but yeah I the the Goblet of Fire was a little bit tricky because there's a lot of like gender stereotypes in it in terms of like the men ask the women to the dance and you know when the the french school shows up it's all of these women that are like these delicate birds and it is then, so funny that the french school is only women in the uh what is it german school no or i think something? it's it's like russian it's or? like yeah it's some sort of eastern europe yeah but it's, <laughs> it's only men. yeah it's like the women are just these delicate birds in these flowing shirts not how it is in the book for the, the record <laughs> the men are like these they walk in they're like oh, oh, and they've got these staffs and stuff and I'm just like, uh, that kind of bothers me a little bit. I don't, I'm just sick of giving that messaging to children of that's how women are and that's how men are and that's how they need to be. But I digress. This was what, 10, 15 years ago? Um, but Probably more. Yeah. Nevertheless, they're both very good movies. Um, so that's, if you haven't seen Harry Potter, <laughs> check it out. Um, okay. Next up, I have two movies that I hated. Oh boy. One is The Bling Ring. I hated this movie. Ooh, I, I've okay. said it before okay. on this podcast. I'll say it again. I do not understand people's love for Sofia Coppola. I have only seen one movie of hers that I actually like. Everything else I'm lukewarm on or I actively dislike. Was the one you like Marie Antoinette? Can you remind yes. me? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, this movie, I could not stand it. I hated the performances. The structure made no sense. The cinematography, the color palettes, the acting, like I just, it just felt like a director who did not know what they were doing and just threw a bunch of things on screen with any thought behind why or how or who or whatever. Um, I find the actual story of these people to be very interesting, but Gosh, this film does not tell this story in a way that is at all interesting to me. Um, So I I just hated it. I was like, this is a waste of my time. I'm very frustrated with how this is, how it's all put together. I I don't know. It just felt like something where it was like, I'm a big name. So I know people will watch this. But it's actually like if anyone else made this, like if this was made by a director that no one knew, it would not be accepted the way that it is. Um, can I just quickly give a, so I've seen the bling ring twice and the first time I watched it, I absolutely had the same reaction as you. I was like, this is bafflingly like feels cold and distant and flat in a way that I don't understand. The second time I watched it, I actually did like it a lot better. But the reason being is my interpretation, which could be completely false, but my interpretation is that this was an intentional choice by the director to kind of get you inside the heads of these kids who are absolutely just, you know, they're all on drugs and Adderall that have dulled their ability to experience the world. They're so overstimulated by consumption and, you know, desire that they have no way to feel, no ability to kind of experience real emotions or color And so the flatness of the movie is trying to put you into that mindset where everything is kind of disjointed. Nothing feels real, if that makes sense. Hmm. So I don't know if this is actually a fair reading or not, if this was intentional, but I liked it a lot more on rewatch because that's kind of the vibe that I was getting. I don't know if that really (laughs) helps at all for you, but just... Yeah, I I just, I don't get it. I don't understand the love for Sofia Coppola, but whatever. Um, Another movie that I watched that I hated was Elizabeth Banks' Charlie's Angels from 2019. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I... uh, Elizabeth Banks is not a good director. I'm sorry. I love her. I don't like her movies. As an actress, she's a bad director. I don't like her movies. This is something where, like, 
I would love a remake of Charlie's Ang- Angels that's more modern, more feminist, more like women can be beautiful but also really pow- like I like what this movie was trying to do. I think it failed on all counts. <laughs> I um the only the only th- reason I watched this movie was because Kristen Stewart is in it. And she's having a great time. Kristen Stewart. I remember really liking her character. Yes. Because I feel like a lot of times what I see her in, especially like the deeper she gets into her career, she can be very intense, very serious, emotional, just heavy sorts of roles. Um, Or sometimes even like a little bit, especially in her past roles, a little bit bland, taking on characters that don't have as much depth. Um, I, I love her as an actor, just saying that across the board and she's having such a good time in this movie i she was captivating she's hot she's so like she she's funny in this movie her character cracks all these little like witty um just like comments and commentary on what's going on um so she's the only thing that makes this movie i was gonna say makes it tolerable she is the only thing that makes this movie not a complete absolute thing that I regret watching and will never watch again. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's Elizabeth's, Elizabeth Banks's Charlie's Angels from 2019. Very lowly recommend. Um, yeah, that's that's that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you have one more you wanted to talk about? Or uh, I can, yeah. Um, yeah, go for it. For the sake of what I just said, I will talk a little bit faster. Not okay. faster. I don't need to talk faster. I need to talk less. <laughs> um <laughs> I watched for the first time um, Tim Burton's Beetlejuice, the original, because obviously the second one came out this year, um, and I'd never seen the original, so I was intrigued. I've obviously seen the iconic scene of people standing up and singing the songs and doing the dance moves, Um, but that was all I'd seen. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. Um, I did not know that Alec Baldwin was in it. Like, <laughs> I started watching it and I was like, first of all, I was like, wait, he's in this? And I was like, wait, he's a main character in this? <laughs> like, yeah. what is happening? Um, Beetlejuice is like, it's kind of like the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie where it's like an all time the one iconic character that everyone thinks of when they first think about this movie is not actually the main character. Well, I was going to say, I don't understand why this movie is called Beetlejuice because he does not show up for quite some time and then he's barely in it. So, I mean, Michael Keaton's performance, he is dedicated and I love it. I love the performances in this movie. I think it's really fun. I really enjoy the practical effects Um, and I think it holds up. So, I mean, Beetlejuice is obviously like kind of a dirt bag but in a way that doesn't feel offensive to me for some reason um but anyway that's that's beetlejuice i enjoyed it i would like to watch it again at some point i thought it was fun cool um let's see okay real quick here are three uh rewatches that i have done in the last few months um first Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy cool. from 2011, which is an adaptation of a John Le Carré novel, uh, spy novel, takes place in the 1960s, stars Gary Oldman and a whole bunch of famous people, Benedict Cumberbatch, Colin Firth, like just a whole bunch of recognizable British faces in this movie. I weirdly, while watching, I just had this experience of like, is this one of the best movies ever made? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> it's... I can't really explain it. Like, I don't even know how to articulate it, what struck me so much about it. Because it is a very, like, sort of slow moving. It's a lot of talking. It's, um, you know, it's very, like, subdued um, in this way that really makes you think of, like, a lot of some, like, sort of spy dramas from, like, the, th- the, the 60s and 70s. But it's just so much a movie about sort of... Um, secrets and memories and regrets and um loyalties and betrayal and like thinking through what you've dedicated your life to and you know do you have regrets about the things that you've done and stuff like that it's just it's so well acted it's so well the like the cinematography and the production design I think the directing is all really really strong I looked it up it wasn't a director that like I don't know I really knew or like was familiar with a lot of his work so 
I don't know where this movie came from and why no <laughs> people are talking about it more, but I really, really liked Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy on my, I mean, I, I think I liked it at the time. I didn't really remember it super well and it just really struck me on this rewatch. Um, and then similarly, Witness from 1985 starring Harrison Ford and Kelly McGillis. Have you ever seen this movie? No. Okay. This is an iconic Philadelphia movie. Um, be, it's about a, um, so there's like a, in an Amish community, there's like a, a single mother and her son who are, they're going through Philadelphia's 30th Street Station and the little boy witnesses a murder. But it turns out that the the murderer is a corrupt cop. And so Harrison Ford is assigned to the case. And when he realizes it's a corrupt cop, he was like, all right, we got to like, we got to get out of here, this town, we got to protect this little boy. Um, so Harrison Ford ends up going undercover in the Amish community with the mom and her son. Um, and that sounds like it could potentially be a premise of like a, you know, silly sort of fish out of water comedy or like some sort of like fun action movie. But actually this movie is kind of, it's slower. It's more of a romantic drama. You know, he and the the mother are kind of slowly drawn towards each other. But um, there's the, you know, they're, they're from these two very different worlds. And so there is a sort of slow melancholy to the fact that they really like each other but ultimately they can't really be together um it's just a I don't know it's it's one of those movies where you come away and you're just like they don't make them like this anymore you know <laughs> it has a really unique premise and it's not flashy or gimmicky in any way it's just really solid really well done um and then third um I was going to talk about oh yes um i rewatched gladiator in mm. anticipation of gladiator 2 it's a good movie um, i stand by it it is a good movie yes i agree i i'd seen it once before not for a very long time it's kind of different than i rem i guess i i just hadn't remembered it very well his sort of rise to being like the top gladiator happens a lot more quickly than i remembered it's sort of like he's in one fight and he does really well and then they're like and now he's the world's top gladiator <laughs> and i was like okay that's fast and there's a lot more like political intrigue than i remember you know there's less gladiatoring um and more like yeah, sort of political backstabbing, but that that's good. I mean, that's not a that's not at all a criticism. Um, yeah, it's it's a really good movie. I'm so curious to see what Gladiator Two is like. I've heard rumors that Paul Mescal's character is playing the little boy Lucian from the first one, but I don't understand how that could be possible since very clearly at the end of Gladiator, Lucian is going to be like the next emperor. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I'm curious. I'm excited. I don't think it's rumored. I think he is. Because you see... Well, okay. Okay, never mind. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what's been confirmed versus just what's rumored. Like, I haven't been following the, the news about that movie too closely because I don't want to spoil myself, so... Since when do you not want to spoil yourself? <laughs> is this a new Geneva? What's happening? I'm not... I, mean, I, don't, I don't actively seek out spoilers. Just sometimes spoilers come to me. Well, I know you don't actively seek them out, but I feel like you don't actively avoid them. And it sounds like you're actively no, it's true. avoiding yeah. this. I have not been actively seeking out news about this movie. Okay. Doesn't mean that I'll like gotcha. turn my face away when it comes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, is it my turn? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and move faster. So a movie that I watched, I don't know if anyone's noticing a trend here. I'm either watching gay movies or movies that are heartfelt and uplifting so if that doesn't communicate anything about why we haven't recorded for the last six <laughs> months then i don't know <laughs> what does um but the next film i'd like to talk about is marcel the shell with shoes on it is a film that came gosh was it two years ago i don't remember um but marcel the shell with shoes on is a youtube channel and youtube videos that i used to watch all the time when I was little I thought the voice was so cute and like the little character of the little shell it just was so so funny in a way that I'd never seen before it's such a unique type of character um so this is a story that is fairly straightforward but it's so sweet because you've got Marcel and then Marcel's grandma gets sick because they lost so they grew up with like Marcel's extended family and then somehow they got lost and it's just the two of them and then they're 
Marcel's grandma gets sick and Marcel goes on a quest to find her extended family and it's just it's just all about like I want to belong and find my family and it's it's just it's so sweet it's so sweet it definitely is kind of more of a it's not really plot heavy it's more so just like you sit in the feelings with this character who's just like trying to go home and has so much love and anyway it's Marcel the shell with shoes on if you just want to have a a pleasant movie on and in, in front of you is just about someone seeking love and trying to find family that's Marcel the shell with shoes on um okay so I am going to jump into some movies that were released this year that I've seen um the first one is drive away dolls it is a I can't say Cohen Brothers because I can't remember if it's Ethan or Seth Cohen that made this movie. It is an Ethan Cohen film because the Cohen Brothers are not making things together right now. Um, this movie is a fun ride. It is something where you kind of gotta just like let the story go a little bit because it's it's a silly movie. I mean, the Cohen Brothers they make movies that are either really serious or really silly. And this is a lot more of like the Raising Arizona kind of tone. Um, So, yeah, it's these two gals who basically, you know, just I'm so bad at remembering like the details of things, apparently. Um, But it's these two gals who kind of, you know, get into some trouble and they're driving around trying to get out of trouble. And, you know, they're just a couple little lesbians trying to like figure out their lives as well. Um, and it's funny because this movie is called Drive Away Dolls, but at the end of the movie, there's like a, a title card and then dolls disappears or something like that. And then Dykes comes up instead because Ethan Cohen wanted it to be called Drive Away Dykes, but he didn't think people would see it if that was the title. So, um, it's definitely like, it's not one of the strongest Cohen films, but it is a fun time of just these two ladies running around, uh, trying to get out of trouble. Like I said, so if you want just like a pleasant Cohen vibe sort of funny um, film, check it out. And then, um, yeah, I'm just kind of going to continue doing movies released this year. The next one I want to talk about is Kinds of Kindness, which is the Yorgos Lanthimos film. Um, I don't know all of the details about this, but I think it was kind of, um, it was simultaneously being filmed with poor things or something like that. I don't remember the details, but one thing I didn't know about it was that it was three different short films within one film. And the first one I found to be very, very captivating, very interesting, um, very intense and dark. Um, I, I'm so sorry. I don't remember the specifics of what happens in it, but I remember I really, really loved it. And then each film after that kind of became a little bit less interesting So by the time we got to the last one, I was like, okay, this is fine. But it's just like, you know, it's kind of gone down in quality for me personally in terms of like the intrigue of the story. Um, So Kinds of Kindness, it's definitely Yorgos returning to his uh, like weirdness of like, hey, I'm a freak and you're either down with it or you're not because I'm going to make you super uncomfortable. Like, yeah, like it's just... It's him just being gross and being weird and being twisted and you either have a palate for it or you don't. And I think the first one, the story is strong enough that it supports the weirdness. Whereas by the, by the third one in particular, it's kind of like, okay, this is just being weird. Like, okay. Um, so kinds of kindness, um, it's not one of my favorite Lanthimos films, but it, you know, the, the first short film was very strong. So I watched that on Hulu if you want to check it out. And then, um, wow, my stuff is in like weird orders here. Um, Okay, and then I want to talk about another movie called Am I Okay? Which is a film that was released on Max, I think, um, starring Dakota Johnson. It is (laughs) another lesbian movie. Surprise, surprise. Um, But it is a film that I thought started out very strong and very relatable. And then it just kind of went in a direction that I was like, you had so much potential. Why did you go this way? This way is so much more boring and basic than it could have been. 
so this is a movie that like I wouldn't necessarily recommend. I don't think that it's bad, but it's also just like it's kind of disappointing because it's it's just starts out very strong and then by the end it's just kind of blah. Um, but you know, it's, it's kind of a light thing to put on the TV. So if you're just wanting to throw something on casually while maybe doing something else, eh, this one works for that. But yeah, that is, am I okay? Starring Dakota Johnson. Okay. Um, just a few last first time watches of movies that came out in the past and then I'll move to, um, first time watches for slowly more recent movies although i have been talking about some of them um okay so first i saw a movie called i know where i'm going this is a powell and pressburger movie from the mid 40s starring wendy hiller who as we've established in our pygmalion episode is an absolute goddess i love her so much this movie is basically the template for every like rom-com where it's like uptight uptight lady gets stranded in a rural community and she's going to meet her fiance but she there's another guy who's charming and he's better for her than her fiance like that is literally what i know what where i'm going is but it's made by Palin pressburger it stars wendy hiller it's set in the 1940s it's this gorgeous black and white photography it's in like this rural scottish hebrides like oh i loved it so much it's charming delightful highly recommend um <clears throat> then um i saw a film called suddenly last summer which is um a drama from 1959 so kind of like toward the end of the studio era we're getting into kind of darker subject matter i believe it's based on a tennessee williams play um it's got elizabeth taylor and montgomery clift you know great great duo who are good friends in real life and then Catherine Hepburn is this sort of villainous, like, um, sort of southern grand dame who basically her her niece has suffered some sort of a breakdown and she really wants her to get a lobotomy because this is the 50s. And Montgomery Clift is the doctor who would theoretically perform the lobotomy and he's getting pressured to do it because she's like this big donor to the hospital where he works. But he keeps talking to Elizabeth Taylor and he's like, no, this woman she's traumatized she experienced something and she's traumatized but she's not like we don't need to do a lobotomy on her and so it takes a while for the story of what happened to come out which i won't spoil but um it's an interesting film very much obviously a time capsule and like you know we're talking about performing lobotomies on women who experienced trauma um but it's it's just very well acted in particular, there's a scene where Catherine Hepburn descends from the ceiling on this like Byzantine throne and is like, welcome to my house. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Which is great. Um, yeah, interesting, interesting movie. Um, kind of pr- pretty dark, but yeah, interesting. Um, what was and that then called? It's called Suddenly Last Summer. Suddenly Last Summer, okay. Yeah. Um, and then finally, a noir called The Big Heat, 1953, Gloria Graham, who's an actress I adore, Glenn Ford, Glenn Ford being kind of like the nice guy cop with a sweet family, but then things go bad when he takes the wrong case and all of a sudden he's like, I'm out for revenge. Who's to know how dark, how far (laughs) I'll go? (laughs) It's a, it's a good movie. Yeah. It's a good noir. Would, would recommend, um, don't have too much specific to say about it, but I liked it a lot. Okay, so I'm getting a little bit to the end of my list here. I've watched a lot less things than Geneva has in the last couple months um, because I just haven't been watching as much as I normally do, and that's fine. Um, So I'm going to finish with one final movie and then three TV shows. Um, So this movie is a movie that I just saw last week. Um, It's called King of Kings Chasing Edward Jones. It is a documentary um, that my dad actually told me about. I was visiting my parents in Los Angeles and he was like, I really would like to take you guys to see this movie. I'd never heard of it, but I was like, sure, that's fine. I always love going to the theater. So the three of us went and it is a documentary about a man named Edward Jones and the director of the film is his granddaughter. And Edward Jones is basically, his history has kind of been erased in terms of mainstream but he was a, um, I don't even know what to call him, but he was a, a black man in the city of Chicago who, um, I'm trying to remember the details of everything. There was so much going on, 
But essentially, like, he became someone who created this underground gambling market with black people in the city. And they would all gamble and do these things. And then he would use all of this money that he earned that he would get from this gambling business. And he would give it back to the community. So he would use the funds to fund schools and libraries and basically just like gave it all back to the Wait, community. Wait, you said this is a true this is a true story. Yeah. Yes, this is a documentary. Um and the director is the granddaughter of Edward Jones. And he was I think he was like the richest black man in in the world or in the country or something like that. Like he had millions of dollars. Um and so the white people in Chicago, particularly like the more governmental figures, they became aware of him and what he was doing. And so he kind of like struck deals with them so that they would let him continue to do what he's doing. But then as time went on, they were like, we don't want this black man having this much power. And then he got involved with Al Capone and like all of those things. And Edward Jones went to jail. If you like, it's just, it's a very fascinating story of someone from my city of Chicago that I didn't even know about. And essentially like they deemed what he was doing as illegal and but he literally invented what we now call the lottery the thing that is very much so legal where everyone gives money and who knows where that goes and someone wins the big amount blah 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 but where is that money going like the lotto money that everyone's paying to buy these tickets where is that going we don't know probably not to like wholesome places where they're giving back to people and so it's very um just kind of uh challenging to look back at the life of this man who invented this system that is so wi- like widely accepted now and like cr- has been created by white people but he actually invented it and used the money for good um so yeah their lives are very fascinating like he moved overseas to France multiple times moved to Mexico because their family was in danger and like they moved a bunch back and forth um and the fascinating thing is that His granddaughter, the one who made this film, she didn't really know about him at all because, like, her family didn't talk about him because they were kind of scared because he had this history that they kind of wanted to hide. And then his brother, his brother ended up, like, after Edward died, his brother ended up basically, so Edward left all of the money to his wife. She was, like, in charge of the business and everything. And so Edward's brother just basically had her signing all of these papers. And then eventually she, without her knowing, signed a paper that gave all of the money over to him. And she was only left with like $50,000 or something like that. And so it's just, it was fascinating to see how the grandchildren and great grandchildren of this man who was incredibly influential, they don't even know who he is. Um, And so anyway, fascinating story. It's a really, it's a very interestingly formatted documentary. Um, The style of it is kind of a style that I haven't seen before because it's got some like animations and drawn images and cartoonish drawn images. Um, But yeah, it was, it was very good, very powerful. Um, And after the screening, the director walked in and we were all like, what? We didn't even know the director was going to be here. There were literally like seven of us in the theater (laughs) like was this at the music box no no this was in LA oh okay sorry yeah yeah yeah. this was in LA um and she was like yeah yesterday I was here and it was a full house but thanks thank you guys for coming today (laughs) like um but it was cool to get to meet her and have those conversations with her um because their family is all over the place she was like yeah I have a brother in Spain I have a sister in Australia I have a like they're just all over the, the planet essentially um so, yeah, that is King of Kings Chasing Edward Jones. Uh, highly recommend. I think he's a very important person to learn about. Um, anyway, yeah. So TV shows, real quick. Um, one, I think I've talked about this already on the podcast, but Geneva and I watched The White Lotus Season 2 together. It was her first watch. It was a rewatch for me. Excellent, excellent season. So good. Geneva, you and I need to talk about this off air because mm-hmm. we cannot do it right now. But now that you've seen The White Lotus Season 2 and the last season of Succession, mm-hmm. I, w- I want to hear your thoughts. Because for me, I mean, I've told you, I was always like, 
any other year, the White Lotus season two <laughs> yeah. would have taken everything. Uh-huh. But success, like, it's yeah. what a year for television. Anyway, it's true. We can I talk didn't even think that about the two of them having we're not competed for Emmys against each other. Oh, I I know it's it's wild, but we can talk about that another time. But White Lotus season two, phenomenal. Please watch. Um, yes, and then two other shows I watched Hacks. Um, which is a show that I believe just won the Emmy for Best Comedy, uh, I think. Uh, yeah, I think you're right, yeah. Yeah, it's a very... I, I like it. I just find the definition of comedy to be very, uh, I don't know, kind of vague at this point. Because <laughs> um, this show does have some very funny moments, um, but it also can be very serious, too. Um, it's The concept of it is there's this woman who is this aging comedian. She was very famous back in the day, but because she was a woman, she never was fully respected the way she should have been. And so she gets older and she brings on this young woman who I think is in her late 20s or early 30s to be her comedy co-writer as she's trying to kind of boost her career. And um, it's it's about the dynamic between these two women and how the younger one is kind of teaching her about um hey, your comedy in the past was kind of problematic. It was sexist. It was classist. It was homophobic. It was all of these things. And her kind of teaching the older woman that like, hey, that's not really okay anymore. And seeing the older woman kind of learn that, but then also teach the younger woman that like, hey, this is how it had to be back then. Because like, in order for me to have a place in comedy, like these are the types of things that were funny. And so it's just, the, the two of them kind of share their own perspectives on comedy and they both grow in the process and obviously like drama ensues between the two of them sometimes and la la la. Um, but it's a great show. Great performances. Um, I, again, I don't know where HBO gets all of these massive budgets for these shows <laughs> for people that have millions of dollars. Um, but yeah, I enjoy it. I look forward to the next season. Um, that is Hacks. And then the last show I will talk about, they just dropped season three, I think two days ago, or maybe it was yesterday. It is a Netflix show called Heartstopper. I've had many people recommend it to me, and I've kind of been putting it off because I'm like, I think it might be too much cheese for me. A little bit too cheesy. Um, I love it. It's fantastic. <laughs> it is definitely cheesy. It's definitely over the top. And it it's definitely a Netflix. It's like teens, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it definitely creates this picture of, like, a high school queer utopia of, like, everyone at this school is queer. And it's every single type of queer. You have trans women. You have bisexuals. You have lesbians. You have gay men. You have gay teachers. You ha- <laughs> It's just, like, everyone at this school is queer. And all of them have these, like, they find a girlfriend or a boyfriend. And it's, like, this love story. And la, la, la. Like, it's um obviously there you know there's like homophobia and stuff that plays into it and all of that but good gosh the love story between these two boys is so unrealistic and so beautiful <laughs> it's just like there were so many moments where in the first season i audibly was like oh <laughs> like they're so cute it's so cute like it's just it's so cute it's so cute and it's so romantic in a way that's just like not real and I always get kind of weird about like high school romance things because I feel kind of like Ugh, I don't want to be watching children like having sex or whatever this show does not do that it's very it's it's not like exploitative in any way there isn't like any sex in it I don't know if there will be this upcoming season as they're getting older I don't know um But it's very respectful. The actors are so good. All of these, I don't even know if they're child actors. They're probably, honestly, all in their 20s. They look like children to me, but they're probably in their 20s. Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) But they're really, really talented. The way that they sell us on these characters in this world that is not real. This world is not real. Um, But if you just want to watch something that almost makes you want to cry because it's so cute and full of so much innocent love, Please watch Heartstopper. It's so cute. I love it. <laughs> anyway, that's Heartstopper. Amazing. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to do one last batch of movies that I've seen that are from the last year or year and a half or so. Um, well, first of all, Hot Glenn Powell Summer has mm. happened. Um, 
which has been very exciting to me, who's been advocating for Glenn Powell as a movie star for years. Uh, Hitman came out. I was able to see it in theaters um, during its very limited release. I liked it a lot, although I was not prepared for the abrupt tonal <laughs> shifts that it would take. <laughs> I would like to see it again, knowing, I think, having a more full idea of what they were going for, because there's a turn that it takes toward the end. I was like, I don't know how I feel about this. I don't know how I meant to feel about this. I don't know how the filmmakers feel about this. I just need to think for a bit. Um, so I'd li- I would like to see it again. Um, but I think it is, it's overall a pretty well done movie. I think the actors are both excellent. Glenn Powell and Iria Arjona are two extremely talented people who are both, from what I've seen of their work independently and then together, are just people who can have chemistry with anyone. <laughs> and so they have a lot of chemistry with each other. Um, it's, there's a lot of fun to it. There's a lot of sort of, um, like, you know, wit and whimsy to it, but then it also has a darker side that gets more prominent as it goes along, which is, you know, it, it's saying some interesting things. I'm not quite sure what it's saying, but it's saying some interesting <laughs> things. So, you know, it's it's worth a watch. It's worth a think. Hitman. Um, and then Twister was just, you know, Twisters. just good times, vibes, no thoughts, head empty, just Twisters being cool people chasing no mention twisters of climate change at all <laughs> <laughs> no mention of climate change although climate change i think is is very clearly the backdrop for why this film is happening because they keep talking about like weird weather patterns things are just gonna keep getting worse they just don't say it's climate change which whatever but um <laughs> it's fine it's a good time i really really enjoyed twisters um is it the greatest movie ever no is it a lot of fun yes great summer movie um, and then shifting gears, two more smaller films that I watched um, this year. Um, so the first is called The Beast. Um, oh, starring... I want to see that so bad. Yes, yes. I. This is one that I really, really want to watch again. I. It doesn't seem to be streaming for free anywhere right now, or at least not on a streaming service I have access to. I ended up having to rent it from Amazon. Um, which is fine, but yeah, I do really want to watch it again at some point. It's it really has stayed with me in a in a certain way. It just creates this sort of atmosphere of dread and unease in this really interesting way. Basically, there's three storylines that take place in three different time periods: the past, the present, maybe like 10, 10 15 years ago, but you know, more or less the present, and then the future. And in each storyline, there are two different two characters played by Leia Sadu and George Mackay, um, who are entangled in some way. In the past, they're sort of like would be lovers who have this sort of like um, kind of will they, won't they, very romantic relationship. In the present, which is a really, really fascinating, tense story, he's like a sort of a creepy incel potential like murderer and he's has fastened himself onto Leia Sedu, who's this actress who's living in LA and is kind of alone and not sure if she what she wants to do with her life and then in the future well that the future is kind of a, a complicated one it sort of ties everything together it's one of those movies where I'm like I don't fully understand what's going on at any given moment but I am so intrigued by what's happening and the acting is incredible. The chemistry between the two of them is strong in all three storylines, but it's so different in different ones where sometimes you're like, oh, I want them to be good together. And sometimes you're like, oh, I'm so tense. Please, like, make everything okay. Um, but yeah, I, I really would recommend The Beast. I hope it, it comes somewhere where it's easily accessible soon. I don't even know if libraries have gotten copies of it yet but I I really desperately want to watch it again Um, okay so the last movie that I wanted to talk about is a small queer British film called Femme which came out also on my list okay (laughs) Um, this is a it's a thriller it's about a um, a man who's a drag queen in Britain I believe not trans I believe he's a a man but a, a, a drag queen um, who is one day while he's out 
um, in his sort of drag um, attire, he's beaten up by this like gang of sort of British thugs. Um, but then later, you know, he and this is a very traumatizing experience for him, um, understandably. But later, like several weeks later, he sees one of them at a like a, a gay bathhouse, and he realizes that he's actually closeted. Um, and, you know, was only going along with the beating slash, like, kind of initiating the beating because, you know, he was with, out with his, like, extremely homophobic, like, um, friends. And so this guy doesn't recognize him outside of his drag attire. And so he start, they start a relationship where the intention is for this guy who is beaten up wanting to find a way to exact revenge on this guy who was a participant in their, um, you know, this really traumatic beating that he experienced. And it's just a really interesting dynamic between the two, this sort of like cat and mouse, like power play. There's this sense of danger, but there's also a sense of like, you know, in a weird way, we're getting to know each other in ways that other people around us are not able to like we see each other in a way that no one else is able to see us but also there's like fear and vulnerability it's so well acted by both so George Mackay plays the the bad guy you know the guy who beats up the um the the tough and then uh Nathan Stewart Jarrett plays the um the the drag artist who's um you know going on this sort of revenge quest and their dynamic together is so intriguing. Um, yeah, there's um, it's a movie where it's like the there's sex scenes that are a bit more explicit than I'm normally comfortable with. You know, I'm kind of brutish when it comes to sex scenes in certain <laughs> ways, <laughs> which is fine. But um, so I was a little like, mm, OK, I maybe seen a little more than I, I need to right now. Um, but the the sort of just the attraction between them is such an essential element of their dynamic because it's sort of attraction and repulsion, you know, like I'm weirdly attracted to this person who is a danger to me versus I'm weirdly attracted to this person. But also I'm terrified that if anyone sees us together, like my life will be over. And so it just it's playing on all these like really uncomfortable tensions Um with it within the lives that these two characters are living and yeah i would i would recommend it if you're interested in that premise because it's really um yeah fascinating and it's it's really a movie that's built around these two performances and they're they're just really really good performance yeah that one's definitely been on my list for a while i think it's on hulu now so i'm definitely looking forward Ooh, okay. to watching it okay yeah yeah um so I'm coming to the end of my list here. So I'm just going to go over really quickly um, just movies that have come out this year that I want to watch. Um, and I believe, I believe I have access to all of these right now. Three of them are streaming and one is currently in theaters. Um, I am, I have on my list to watch the movie Challengers. Um, I did not see it in theaters because I was concerned that there were going to be certain things that would be triggering to me. Um, and so I was like, I'd rather watch this at home where if it's too much, I don't, I, I didn't waste, you know, $15 of my, of my money. So that is on deck for me to watch soon. Um, I also really, really want to see, I saw the TV glow. It's a A24 film that I was unable to catch in theaters this summer. Um, I wish I had, because I love supporting movies like this in the theater, but it just didn't happen. Um, so I saw the TV glow. I'm pretty sure is on Max. Um, and then Civil War, I also think is on Max. I did not see that in theaters because I was like, I don't think I'm emotionally ready to watch this. Um, <laughs> and I also don't know if I'm emotionally ready to watch it now. But I do know that I will watch it at some point. I find Alex Garland to be a very interesting director. Um, in my experience, his projects are either a big hit or a big miss. So we'll see. Um, and then the last thing I'm really excited about, I think by our next podcast recording, I will have already seen this. That is my goal. I really, really am excited to see The Wild Robot in theaters. 
Um, I've been waiting to see it ever since uh, the trailer first came across my path. I don't know, like a year ago or something like that. Um, I'm very excited to take my niece. I've been waiting for the perfect film to be her first film to see in theaters. And I feel like this is going to be a great choice. Uh, if I do say so myself, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> um, but I I can't wait to see it. And I can't wait to hear my niece's thoughts after she sees it. Assuming my sister lets me take her. But I don't see why she wouldn't let me. So, um, But yeah, that is The Wild Robot. So... Those are, that's my list of, uh, you know, movies I've watched, TV shows I've watched, and things I want to watch coming up. So, there you go. I'm done. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for the record, I also saw, saw Civil War and really liked it, and Challengers, and loved it. But I intentionally didn't talk about Challengers, because I was like, too many things to say. We'll, I'll wait till Tatum sees it, and then maybe we can actually talk about it. But yeah, Challenger is my number one of the year. I love it so much. Um, all right. I've just, I'm just going to list a couple of TV shows that I have watched in the last few months. Um, recently, I've been on kind of a TV binge, which is not my normal um, state of being. But there it is. Um, so obviously, Tatum already talked about White Lotus. Great. Amazing. Highly recommend. <laughs> I also <laughs> I also binge Succession, um, which... It's so good. Can I jump <laughs> As in? everyone has said. Geneva, I, I, blah, 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 blah. okay. Yes. So the entirety <laughs> of the run of Succession, I was the only one that I knew that was watching it. And it was incredibly frustrating because it is a show that is so fun to like talk about with people and also watch live and like wait from week to week and from season to season. It really is a show that in my opinion suffers from binging but I'm very I understand I'm a minority in that for a lot of people I just prefer the format of certain shows being released every week um anyway yeah I my, can the whole time I was watching the show I was begging Geneva to watch it and she wouldn't <laughs> do it and then she's watching it now and she's like I want to talk about all these things and I'm like Geneva, I don't remember like why didn't you watch it when I asked you to watch it so we could watch it at the same time it's a fair it's a fair question I was not emotionally ready for it at the time I mean I told you that like when it first started coming out I think maybe the first season had come out I tried to start watching it and I just got so stressed I out. told I you it got better <laughs> <laughs> well it wasn't it's not like it ch- it's not like the show changed. I think it's that I changed and my attitude toward it changed. When I started viewing it more as a comedy, more as a satire than as a here are characters that you need to be concerned for their welfare, <laughs> then I started being able to latch on to it more. Um, because these characters are all awful people. doesn't mean we can't sympathize with them at certain points, but they're all pretty awful at one point or another and so you have to I had to be ready to sort of disconnect to a certain extent and um just be able to go along for the ride which I wasn't ready for at the time but now I am that final season because we talked a bit about um Kieran Culkin's performance as Roman incredible oh man that final season where it's like there's the episode with the election where he is being the biggest of dicks in the entire universe, I was so mad at him. I was like, I, you built up all this goodwill with me, and now you're basically throwing the election toward a Nazi for no reason than your own ego. Like, what is wrong with you? I hate you so much. And then the next episode is a character's funeral, and he gives a very powerful performance there. And I was like, oh, gosh. But I can't hate you all together because you're so broken. They're all so broken. Yep. Yep. Also... Can I just say the like relationship between Greg and Tom, which starts as like a very like Iconic. unhealthy, toxic, like just, you know, abuse. But then as it goes along, you're like, actually, maybe they kind of have the healthiest dynamic of anyone <laughs> in the show, which is less a testament to how healthy their, their dynamic is and more a healthy testament to how unhealthy everyone else's dynamic is. But by the end, there are moments between the two of them. I'm like, this is kind of romantic. I'm kind of like 
kind of giggling and kind of kicking my heels Should a Tom bit. get remarried? Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> One of my favorite lines in the show was when Tom says to Greg, buckle up, fucklehead. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> What's his iconic line where he's like, you can't make a tomlet without breaking a few bricks. <laughs> 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 it's so good. <laughs> I love that whole back and forth, too, of like, we are listening. Yeah, yeah, but like, we actually kind of are listening so <laughs> we're listening we why am you. i why am i only we're, hearing about this we hear what are we supposed to, what are we supposed to do now <laughs> so good so good so good um yeah i mean there are moments on that show that just come a little too close to reality but you know that's the way it is sometimes um yeah. let's see i have been slowly working my way through the show fargo like i'll, I'll watch oh, a season of that. it yeah, yeah. I mean, I watched seasons one and two a long time ago, um, liked them both, but then just had never continued. Watched a few episodes of season three, wasn't really grabbing me, so I moved on to season four. Season four, I really, really liked. It did take me a while to get through, just because it can be so dark and heavy at certain times. But have you seen season four of Fargo? No. It's the season with Chris Rock and Jesse Buckley. and No, my mom worked on that <laughs> season, though. Oh, wait, really? That's so cool. Mm -hmm. Oh, awesome. Yeah, great 1950s hairstyles in that show. Um, it's a really, it's such an intriguing premise for a season. It's definitely, of the ones I've seen so far, the most disconnected from the actual Fargo, Minnesota setting because it's in Kansas City. But the idea is that it's all about the s American cycle of immigration, people being discriminated against because they're immigrants, because they're outside their other they then become assimilated and then start discriminating against the next cycle of people who come in, which is such a fascinating dynamic that I haven't seen explored in this particular way. The very first episode basically traces the history in Kansas City where it's like this Jewish population moved in, kind of formed like an organized, I don't know if it was organized crime, but you know, some sort of like um, organized something <laughs> or other. And then the Italians moved in. And then they sort of faced off with each other, and then eventually the Italians won. And then the um, African Americans started moving into town, and then they're facing off against each other when the show starts. And it's there's the upper crust, waspy, elite white people who look at the Italians as like lesser than them, but then the African American immigrants are even lesser than them. And there's, there's this weird hierarchy that they're jostling for power in this, you know, rigged elitist hierarchical game that should not exist. It's just so fascinating about, you know, exploring this dynamic within, I mean, human, human societies in general, but like this very specifically American um, dynamic, you know, with the amount of immigration that we have. And yeah, as, as always, you know, really good acting. Um, so many great, like, you know, recognizable faces on this season. You've got Jason Schwartzman, you've got Chris Rock, you've got Jesse Buckley, you've got like um, Jack Houston, just, yeah, so many. But yeah, it was a, it was a really good um, season. I'm excited to see the most recent season, which I, I've heard is also very good. Um, and then the last one I wanted to talk about, I'm in the midst of a rewatch of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's my first time rewatching it since I first watched it in college. Oh, um, wow. So it's been a long time. I'm only on season two, but I'm just like, the show is so good. <laughs> How is this show so good? And also, why didn't we appreciate like really well done broadcast TV when we had it? Like, I don't know. It's just so much nostalgia for it. It's these seasons are in the 90s, taking place in the 90s. So all the the clothing, the lack of cell phones, <laughs> you know, just such a such a different time. But the writing is so excellent and, you know, it's a little, it, there, there's cheesiness. There's, the budgets aren't the highest. Um, there are some things that are very like, oh, here's, you know, our after school special messaging that we're going to give about the dangers of doing drugs or whatever. But um, it's just, it's a really well done show. And from what I remember, it only goes uphill from there. Um, so if you've never seen Buffy the Vampire Slayer, I really, really recommend it. All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Is that it? Did you reach the end of your list? Yeah, that's it for me. Wow. Okay. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs>
no you're like i'm done no um no i feel like our listeners are done uh i don't yeah. know maybe understandable you guys enjoyed this we will put a list of all of our films in the show notes so that way you can we will yeah i will okay, i don't cool. know i feel like that'd be helpful maybe it'll yeah, help yeah. people realize if it's worth it to actually listen to it or not. <laughs> um yeah with time stamps for each no just no we're not doing no that. no 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 i mean Sorry. you can do that i'm not going to um <laughs> yeah okay well yeah so this has been good i yeah there's been so much and there's so many things that i skipped over because i didn't yep. have much to talk about all right well thanks for mm. hanging around everybody and yeah. thank you for being patient with us as we have uh been taking care of ourselves before mm-hmm. coming back and recording again um, so as I said in the beginning, we are releasing episodes every other week now. So our next episode will be released in two weeks and we will be talking about The Village, Geneva's yeah. Pick. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Till then. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.